Welcome, welcome. Um, very, very pleased indeed to be introducing Dr. Andrea Grubb-Barthwell um, to ICAD. Welcome to ICAD, uh, Andrea, as well. Um, it's, uh, we have a fascinating session um, for you today, uh, and I've just been having a little chat with Andrea about it, and it's kind of, I think, I've had a, we had about three minutes of conversation and I just have even more questions and thoughts now as a result. Um, but, but obviously the, uh, the purpose of your uh, presentation is to explain um, the neuroscience behind addiction and how the brain works and develops and the reasons that uh, addiction occurs in people uh, from that neuroscientific point of view. Uh, but very importantly, it, uh, Andrew is going to explain it in a way that uh, you don't have to be a neuroscientist to understand it, which uh, I know from my point of view, uh, that is really important. And um, hopefully uh, you're going to get an awful lot um, from this presentation. So I'm um, really, really pleased that so many of you are here in the room. Um, I am just going to read a very short introduction to Andrea, and then I'll be handing over. Um, so Andrea, uh, Dr. Andrea grubb Brathwell is the Chief Medical Officer for Treatment Management Company. She's also the founder and CEO of Two Dreams, and the founder and Chief, Execu Chief Executive Officer of EM, EM Global LLC. Dr. Barthel served as Deputy Director for Demand Reduction in the Office of National Drug Control Policy under President George W. Bush. Uh, in 2003, Dr. Barthel received the Betty Ford Award for the Association for Medical Education and Research in Substance Abuse. And in 1997, Dr. Barthwell's peers named her one of the best doctors in America in addiction medicine, which is incredible. Um, and my only question, Andrew, is how do you find the time to do all of that? It's uh, unbelievable. Um, but I'd ask you to give a very, very warm welcome to Andrew grubb -Barthel. Thank you. I guess I'd have to tell you, David, that I neglect myself and everyone I love. <laughs> but it's something that we all find ourselves doing from time to time, and we work for that balance. Um, I was putting up not the victory sign or the peace sign. I was saying I worked for Bush too, so in 2002 to 2004, and I was Mike Trace's counterpart in the US and he and I did a lot of work together during our time serving in government. Um, I actually had a chance to catch up with him last night, I know many of you know him, um, to just review where we are and where we were and how much we got done and how little is going on now. We have a you know, major crisis in the United States over opioids. I've got some disclosures as a physician, I always tell you who pays me. Um, because then you can at least have an idea about why I might be saying the things that I'm saying. I also am saying that in terms of disclosures today, this lecture has nothing to do with people who make medic medications for drugs. I'm not going to be talking about any specific drugs. Um, Encounter Medical Group is where I see patients. Um, Ideal Option is a group of people who provide medicine for opioid addiction. And um, uh, the others are treatment um, companies, I'm not going to be talking about any models of treatment today, so I'm not selling you anything by people who pay me money. Um, I also work for the U.S. Department of Justice, and we've been going around um, prosecuting individuals who engage in fraud and abuse on the urine drug testing scene in the United States. You probably don't have that problem here yet, but there's a lot of money that's being made from testing the urine of people in treatment too frequently. And um, the U.S. Department of Justice has been trying to claw back money from people who have made a lot of money off of looking at pee. And I've uh, helped them develop their methods for looking at programs to see whether their practices are outside of the community standard and uh, then prosecuting them when it is. Um, so here are my presentation objectives. I want to talk about the, sci the scientific understanding of substance use disorders. And when David and I were talking, I was saying that um, to me, it's a primary brain disease. You don't need greater underlying psychopathology to become addicted. Like, you don't have to have something wrong with you to become addicted to substances if you use them over time. And um, I forgot I had the mic on me. That's why I keep making all this noise. And, and that, you know, he talked about, well, there's maybe trauma, and there are, you know, there's a, there's, there are people who are exposed to trauma who then can't tolerate the way they feel when they're not finding a chemical solution to life's problems and 
that may in fact be a predisposing condition to using, but I'm talking about what happens in the brain after an exposure. And so then he said, oh, so it's like um, a genetic disease, like diabetes. And in fact, yes, but if you just have the genetic predisposition and you never get exposed, we won't know you have the disease. So you have to have the, pre have to have the predisposition and the exposure in order for the disease to be expressed. So we're going to talk about that. But basically what happens into the, in the brain after repeated exposure to a substance that can do something for you that you may not be able to do for yourself at a time when you're engaging in the substance use. Um, we're also going to look at the, our understanding of substance use disorders, that's the SUD there, and think about how we understand it and why medications are being developed the way they are these days to sort of help supplement counseling. And many of you, if you are working in, uh, they, I guess they call it harm reduction over here, methadone treatment for opioid use, um, we have been calling it medication-assisted treatment, and in the American Society of Addiction Medicine, now we call it medication. And not medication-assisted treatment, medication treatment, um, because we know that medications can um, restore normal functioning by leaving the receptor in an on position for many, and that that may need to be assisted by treatment, but for many people who are exposed to medications alone, they can have a tremendous change in the way they're, in which their disease is expressed. So there's that. And then we're going to look at some of the emerging treatments. And then um, we're going to talk, we're going to end on a note where we can explore whether we have any internal bias that would cause us to want to recommend one treatment over another to an individual. Uh, you know, you may be one who wants to recommend that we block your receptors and that's going to keep you from using or you may be one that wants to fill the receptor or you may be one that wants to fix the receptor and not use any medications in your treatment and just sort of understanding the source of why you would make a predetermination about what is going to be the best modality to treat someone before you've seen that person and evaluated them and their potential for recovery or rehabilitation in the absence of something that might help them. So we're going to review the current understanding of the neuroscience underlying substance use disorders. Um, we're going to outline some current treatment approaches based on that neuroscience and list the current responses to substance use disorder, the psychosocial therapies, the medication therapies, and the combination therapies. And I'm going to give you the take-home message first. Alan Leshner, who was the head of our National Institute on Drug Abuse, said in the late 80s, uh, mental health therapy works best with talk therapy on a platform of medication therapy. So that if you had someone who had a mental health disorder, you would initiate medication therapy in order to mobilize them to gain benefit from talk therapy. But on the substance abuse side, uh, medication therapy works best on a platform of talk therapy. So we would engage someone in talk therapy, primarily group therapy, most effective way of reaching people initially. You'll see that there are a lot of programs now that advertise themselves as being a program where you would go and you have a psychiatrist assigned to you, individually to you. And that this, you'll see your psychiatrist daily, and this would be the method to get to recovery. Well, um, we know that most of what's been shown about what's effective on 12-step facilitated or abstinence-based therapy comes out of group therapy rather than individual therapy. And if you understand individual therapy as being something where a person has to be, feel safe and can trust before they can be engaged in it, you would wonder why you would spend your money and resources giving somebody one-on-one -on -one individual therapy before they're prepared to take advantage of it. So um, what Alan Leshner recommended was getting people engaged in talk therapy in groups, um, let them establish some safety and trust, and then once we got them mobilized with talk therapy, we could use medication therapy to assist them along. So that was the way to combination therapy. There's been a big shift in the U.S. government where on one hand, uh, President Trump's drug opioid czar is going around the country saying we are using medication therapy 
to stem the tide of the opioid epidemic and we're pushing medication therapy and there's been some research that shows medication therapy alone doesn't need to be paired with any kind of talk therapy so we're pushing medication therapy and this is the new approach but we have somebody dying about every 13 minutes in the United States and we do know that where buprenorphine has been initiated death rates drop by 50 percent within the weeks to month after initiating buprenorphine therapy so that's the basis of that so while we're promoting buprenorphine therapy as a response to opioid addiction in the United States, the FBI is raiding doctors' offices who are providing buprenorphine therapy. So we're having a little bit of a mixed message in terms of how that's playing out, and we're going to have to watch that for a minute. But I just say that to remind you that talk therapy is the basis of therapy on the addiction side, and medication therapy works best on a platform of talk therapy from all the science so far. And then we're going to explore your selection bias a little bit. So this is the ASAM definition of addiction, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And we've been organized for, in the uh, mid-50s, the American Society of Addiction Medicine came together um, out of a group of scientists that were in the New York Academy of Sciences. And We've spent a lot of time working on this. So addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, related circuitry. There's going to be a test on this afterwards, <laughs> right? Dysfunction in these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestation. So rather than reading this to you, we're going to break it down and unpack it. And that's what the talk is about. And we're going to talk about the neurological basis of addiction without showing you a single brain slide. You may have been in one of these talks before. If you've ever heard um, the current head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse speak, Nora Volkaw, she has lots of brain slides that she's showing people. And I kind of get cross-eyed when I have to watch too many of them. So I decided to do this talk and take all the brain slides out because you don't need to know the brain anatomy in order to understand this. So what do I mean when I say addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry? When I say it's a primary disease, I mean that there doesn't need to be any greater underlying psychopathology. It's not necessary. You don't have to have a reason to use drugs. In fact, anyone here ever used alcohol or drugs or tobacco? Let's see your hands if you have ever used alcohol, drugs, or tobacco. So most of you, when you had your first using experience, you did it for hedonistic reasons, right? You did it because somebody told you it was going to make you feel good. So you didn't do it to change the way you feel. Now, some of you may have used it for social lubrication. You drink on your way to a party because you feel a little uptight in social situations and you want it to have a little social grease so that you could be a little friendlier and feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, some of you may have used it as sexual grease. You're a little uptight, tonight's the night, right? It's prom night, you want to lose your virginity. You drink a little too much alcohol so that when you get up in the morning, you can look yourself in the mirror and say, the alcohol made me do it. It wasn't this, just that I'm a loose woman. Um, so People do it for a variety of reasons, but most people don't do it because they're so depressed that they know that alcohol will relieve their depression. In fact, it's a bad drug to relieve depression. Some people use it because the first time, that little simple molecule in alcohol, the first time is very good at inducing sleep. It's horrible after the first time, but sometimes people do it to help them sleep, whatever. But most of us had our first using experience in the company of our friends with an expectation that we were going to feel good because somebody hypersold us. Someone in our peer group had experienced it and they sold us that it was going to be a fun experience. It's also a chronic disease, meaning it's persistent, long-standing, and it acts long-term. And it's a disease. Now, that's where sometimes the argument falls about. This is not a disease, it's a behavior. Well, here's the problem that most people have in understanding this. Drug use is a preventable behavior, but addiction is a fundamental yet treatable disease of the brain. So there's a point in drug using when you have volitional control over the choice to use or not. And Nancy Reagan was right, just say no. Because when you are just drug using, you actually can choose to use or not. 
But once the flip has switched and you have lost control over the decision to use, it is converted from being a behavior to a disease of the brain. So drug use is a preventable behavior, but addiction is a fundamental yet treatable disease of the brain. And because drug use is a preventable behavior, people often react to it as if it were something that you could just stop if you wanted to. And in fact, I've been trying to tell people since I was in the Office of National Drug Control Policy that non-dependent users set at a critical crossroads between non-users and dependent users. And we actually do want non-dependent users to not use. Because non-dependent users, particularly new users, recruit new users. And if people weren't new users or non-dependent users, more people wouldn't be joining them on that pathway. You know? And it's the non-dependent users who champion the use to people who haven't used before to get them to norm their own behavior right? within a peer group. Peer pressure is not this amorphous thing that weighs down on us. Peer pressure happens in a peer group, and it's very intimate and very vigorous in support of norming your behavior to mine. So when I have a behavior, I've engaged in a behavior that you're not engaging in in the peer group, I want to be norms back to the peer group, so I try to recruit you to my behavior. So drug use is a preventable behavior, but addiction is a fundamental yet treatable disease of the brain. And there's a switch that flips. We're going to talk about that switch that flips. So it's like all non-users and non-dependent users are cucumbers, but when the switch flips, they become pickles, and you can't go back to being the way that you were before the switch flipped. I also like to point out, as Bob DuPont does, that if you have had a using experience, just one, that your relationship with chemicals is fundamentally changed from that point on. You may be a non-dependent user, but you can never go back to having, being a never have used. You may go back to being a non-user, but once you have had experience with the chemicals, the way in which you receive prevention messages changes fundamentally and you don't respond to messages that would warn you off from the behavior in the same way because you have experienced joy. You know, once you've learned what the high is about, you've experienced. You cannot forget that is experientially learned. You cannot forget something that you've learned through experience. The brain has a muscle memory. The muscles have memory. You cannot forget something that you've learned through experience. So your brain is fundamentally changed. But it's a disease, and a disease is defined as an interruption or cessation or disorder of bodily functions, systems, or organ. We know what the target organ is. It's the brain. There are lots of other organs that are targeted by this disease, too. The heart with holiday heart, um, the liver, the pancreas, uh, cocaine uh, targets the arteries. All kinds of organs are affected, but it resides in the brain. And you only need two of the three in order to say that something's a disease, that it has a recognizable etiology. There's something that you recognize that causes it. It has predictable signs and symptoms. Signs are the things you observe, symptoms are the things you complain of, and consistent anatomical alterations, one person to the next who has the same disease. So this meets the definition of a disease. Addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. So in the brain, there are a group of neural structures that are responsible for incentive salience, making um, something have value and importance in your life that, um, that, you, will, you, know, that you will engage in. So there is an incentive for doing it. And the incentive salience is made up of motivation, wanting, desire, and craving, and also associative learning. So there's a positive reinforcement and classical conditioning that goes along with the behavior. And positive emotions. Pleasure is at the core of drug use. Joy, euphoria, and ecstasy. Now, if you understand that, there's a group of brain structures that make it important for you to engage in the behaviors that reinforce the behavior, which means there's a tendency for that behavior to be repeated. 
and that the reward that creates the tendency for that behavior to be repeated is at its basis joy. In order to get somebody to stop, it can't be painful work, right? Recovery has to be full of joy. If I'm going to stop doing the thing that has a high degree of predictability and at the base of it is joy, euphoria, and ecstasy, the stuff that you substitute for it has to have and bring me as much joy, euphoria, and ecstasy. All right? Otherwise, I'm not going to continue on this path without the thing that gives me joy, euphoria, and ecstasy. Now, some of you are thinking, well, you can't understand, you're not really understanding this because we know that when somebody's at their end stages of their disease, they're not even getting pleasure out of the drug anymore, right? It's not pleasurable. They're seeking that first high that they got. But that's where the reinforcement comes in, you know. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you that while we have said that and drummed that into people's heads, not all drug use at all stages is drudgery. Not all drug use at all stages is drudgery. A lot of getting up with your sick on, getting the drug to get your sick off, to get more drug, to try to get high enough to experience what you're putting in your system and repeat it using until you get a good nod off or you feel some euphoria is drudgery. But at some point during the day, you are going to override, if you're fortunate enough to have enough money, you will override your upper border boundary and you'll go into a zone where you're feeling some of what you recall from the first times that you used, right? It's not just all automatic behavior. There are some rewards that continue even to the end. And in fact, most people will put themselves through forced periods of abstinence or reduced use in order to drive the size of their habit down. Now with opioids, the system that the opioids act on is extremely elastic, right? If you build up the amount that you're taking on a daily basis, you can build yourself up to a prodigious amounts of opioids that you can take on a daily basis and not overdose from. Think about that. You can, your system, the opioid system is so elastic, it can tolerate huge amounts of opioids if you build yourself up gradually to that a, a point. And I always say that the guy who has a $10 million trust fund is a guy who's going to have a $12 million heroin habit, <laughs> right? Because no matter what you do, you will exceed, you will, your habit will outstrip your resources at some point. No matter how much you start with, you'll build yourself up to a point where you're using beyond your means. And it's at that point where you're using beyond your means where on a daily basis you're in some crisis because you're not able to get high the way that you want to or used to be able to. But I know when I um, see patients often that they'll tell me they put them, lock themselves up uh, with you know, some alcohol and some other stuff. They're using a lot of gabapentin and other kinds of anti-hypertensive medications to take the edge off while they get their opioid habit to retract a little bit so they can afford it again. But that is the, at the core of all this, is our desire to experience that joy, euphoria, and ecstasy. So for recovery, another take home message, it's gotta be full of joy, euphoria, and ecstasy. Now how do we get that as humans? By relating to other people on an emotional level. There's no other way you know, there's no point in living if we can't connect on an emotional level with other people, right? So treatment has to be about getting you and your chemicals out of the way so that you can experience the joy, euphoria, and ecstasy of connecting on an emotional level with somebody else. And that's what will keep you coming back. The reward of the drug is responsible for the attraction and the motivation to approach and consume. Now, this is overcoming messages that have been driven into our heads, conflictual messages, but messages generally that are moving in the direction of telling you to avoid using these things. I mean, because you hear all your life that these things are things you shouldn't use, except for we're, you know, a bit conflicted about alcohol, 
because we have parents who might let us have a sip of alcohol when we're little, all the while saying, do as I say, not as I do. You know, I want you to learn how to use this safely here, but I don't want you using it. You know, so there's messages are full of conflict. And part of what parents have to do is they have to get better about taking the ambiguity out of the messages and not the avoidant messages that we give to our children. Because even though, and I'll, I'll hear from people all the time, well, we're a society of pill takers. I mean, I can't help but turn on the TV and see all these messages about take a pill for this and take a pill for that. And I really don't believe that we as individuals get most of our information from people who aren't connected to us about really important things, right? Like we believe the TV, the ad man more than we do our mom. I don't, you know, some people think you do, okay. I, 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 I'm not sure that we do. I'm not sure that we do. I had a, say it louder. Yes. Uh, okay, so the comment is you see more advertisements in America than you talk to your mother because she's working. And the, uh, just, just for the tape, for the purposes of the tape, he's also saying that the advertisers are much more skilled at presenting a message that we'll find to be compelling. And we could debate that probably in another lecture. I think that people um, underestimate, and we did research studies on it. I ran the national anti-drug campaign in the United States when we uh, took it in a different direction. We didn't have the authority to talk about tobacco or alcohol because they were legal products, but we did drugs. And we reframed the ad campaign, but we also brought in parental efficacy as one of the messages. Because if you interview the parents of a bunch of teenagers, they'll say that their teenagers are much more reliant on their peers than their parents for direction. And if you interview the teenagers, they'd say, I'm much more reliant on my parents than my peers for direction. So what we found was that parents were checking out and not continuing to message to their teenagers because they thought they lost relevance and what we were doing was trying to invite them back into the conversation. So yes, uh, seeing ads on TV all the time is kind of seductive <coughs> about taking a, peer, a pill to cure everything about you. Um, but people are in general exposed to a lot of messages and uh, you can be very selective about who you believe and who you don't believe. And I think that even though we're getting these messages to avoid substances, some of our communication is ambivalent from our parents. And um, the reward that we experience in that close peer group with our first using is very important for helping us to overcome the anti-drug messages that we might have been exposed to prior to that. Now addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Our survival as an individual and a species depends upon maximizing contact with beneficial stimuli and minimizing contact with harmful stuff, right? Have you ever had a bad reaction to food stuff, a food stuff? You'll never again want to touch it, right? We have a tremendous memory about staying away from stuff that makes us sick. And if we, you know, my, I remember my son had a bad experience with a banana. He, to this day, will not touch bananas. He had an overripe banana when he was about four, he, and he's 35 today, and he's never touched another banana. So we have a survival memory to keep us away from the harmful stuff. And reward evolved in this brain that is very powerfully attached to good stuff versus bad stuff to help increase the adaptive fitness of our species. What do I mean by that? So rewards produce an association between the reward and the behavior. If you try it, you'll like it. You try it, you have a positive response to it. You try it, it feels good, you'll try it again. And rewards affect our decision making and induce the approach behavior. So it's the thing to overcome the warning. And there are things that are natural in our environment 
that, are, that send off warnings, like a rose bush has thorns. That's a natural warning to us to stay away from it. But the smell and the beauty of us brings us in. So there are things that can overcome the warning off. Rewards also elicit positive emotions and pleasure. So it's the you know, ding, ding, ding of um, the one-armed bandit. Even though we know we're spending and losing a lot of our money, that, that reward keeps us going back in. And rewards are the basis of wanting things and liking things. And the warning is the appetitive desire, the desire, the appetite for it. The wanting allows us to engage in the approach behaviors. The warning, warn, wanting uh, the preparatory behaviors and other instrumental behaviors to getting it and anticipatory behavior. Now, if you talk to somebody who has a dependence, there is anticipatory withdrawal, which begins as their blood level is dropping to the lower border boundary below which they will go into withdrawal. There are lots of preparatory behaviors to getting more substance, to use the substance, to avoid going into withdrawal. So rewards can be associated with positives, bringing about the euphoria, but also rewards, you can be rewarded if you avoid a negative. Now positives rewards are much greater at inducing a behavior than avoiding a negative. So if you're trying to get somebody to do something, you're much more effective at getting them to engage in a behavior that they are rewarded for than you are to get somebody to avoid doing something from a, for a behavior that they're punished over, right? Rewards that actually happen and create the ding, ding, ding are going to induce more behaviors than trying to avoid being punished. And then the wanting is also the seeking. The liking comes from consuming it and taking it. So the reward is located in this, this, now this is probably one of only two times that I'm going to talk about uh, an area of the brain, the cortical basal ganglia, thalamal cortical loop. So from the primitive area of the brain underneath the cortex, which is where, you know, our motor cortex, our sensory cortex, our visual cortex, and our executive control center in the frontal cortex is located. Underneath that, there's this more primitive area of the brain that is the, our survival brain. So there's a loop between that area of the brain and the thalamus and areas of the master glands in the brain and the executive control center. And when that loop gets interrupted, the message that is received by that person's brain is, we're not engaging in something that is going, that's life-threatening. So the message is to the person who has this now, this loop working for them in their reward, is that if I don't use, I may as well be dead. So the behavior that we see is behavior that is consistent with behaviors that support survival of the individual and or survival of the species. This loop involves neural transmitters of glutamate, which is the gas in the brain, GABA, which is the break in the brain, and dopamine. So for example, there are some um, sleeping pills which work on the GABA system because it turns down consciousness. And the glutamate system is turned on by the wavelength of sunlight. So if you go and sit in the sunlight in the morning for 20 minutes or more, and you bathe your retina with the wavelength of sunlight, it is one of three sensory inputs that are needed to tell your brain that you need to transfer from a sleep cycle to an awake cycle. It's a part of supporting your circadian rhythm, sitting in the sunlight in the morning. You need two or three inputs in order to be successful. So the second input is letting the sun touch your skin. A third input might be putting a small bite of something in your stomach because unless you're, on, uh, unless you're on certain sleeping pills that are associated with getting up at night and eating, generally we don't let something go down our esophagus and end up in our stomach unless we're awake. So the three sensory inputs are, are critical toward allowing you to go from a GABA state, which is the sleep state, to the glutamate state. Also dopamine, we're gonna talk about in a minute, is critical for both setting up and sustaining the behaviors that support drug taking.
other areas of the brain and other neurotransmitters we're going to leave for neuroscientists. Uh, but what I want you to know about this is that this basal ganglia, this primitive area of the brain, drives the activity and dopamine pathways set up and are necessary for the reward of initiation. So what are the primary rewards? There are, there are behaviors and rewards that facilitate the survival of the individual and the species. So one of those rewards are the homeostatic rewards, eating when hungry and drinking when thirsty. Reproductive rewards are also critical for passing along our genetic potential and also creating survival of the species. So they are the things that um, encourage us to engage in sexual behavior when aroused. And in primitive animals, you see signaling of uh, readiness to be mounted by the female. So the male mounts the female when she is, in fact, able to reproduce and parental investment rewards. Now, what might you say are parental investment rewards? So I used to do this uh, call with my staff every morning and looking out my window, there was a bird's nest. And the bird's nest was populated by three different types of birds in the spring. They had their eggs at different times and one would vacate the nest and another family would move in. And the mother would have to put these eggs down and sit on them. And then when those babies were born, they sat there with their mouth open while she flew back and forth between the nest and whatever her source of food was to feed them. Neglecting all of her own needs in order to get food into the mouths of those babies. Now, of course, the most aggressive baby get fed more often, but the parental investment was keeping those baby birds alive until she could kick them out of the nest and they could feed themselves. We also engage in parental investment for rewards. So we work, save money to pay for secondary education for our children, right? Some of us who didn't stop having children at an early age are trying to pay for both retirement and college out of the same set of funds. And you will actually sometimes jeopardize your own well-being so that the people that you brought here do better than you did when you got here, right? So that's the parental investment. There are intrinsic award, rewards, things that are inherently pleasurable. So you do it just to experience the pleasure of it. How many of you, when you jog, get an endorphin kick? I am so jealous. I have had only one endorphin kick ever in my life due to my jogging. And I jogged to stay fit during medical school. I counted every single step I ever took <laughs> while jogging. And once, at some point after that, I was jogging on the lakefront in Chicago and I got an endorphin kick and it so, was uh, so unsettling <laughs> that I walked home. <laughs> but there are things that people do because there are intrins intrinsic rewards to you. And if you're going to get the reward, you'll do it. There are also things that are extrinsic rewards. They're not inherently rewarding, but pleasure is associated with it. For some, it's making money. <coughs> Others are watching sports. And there are some things that we learn how to do because we feel the pleasure after we've been conditioned to do it. So buying lottery tickets again and again and again, and maybe getting paid off once or twice, and then still doing it even though you're, you know you're negative upside down. <laughs> Now, when we take it from animal behavior and human behavior and, and go down to animal behavior in the lab, there are dozens of sites in the brain where if we put a probe, an animal will bar press to get either electrical stimulation of that part of the brain or to have a drug dropped into that part of the brain. And the response habits to touching that bar to get that area of the brain stimulated are very similar to the response habits we see in, 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 re, in response to primary <laughs> rewards. So stimulation is, here is both rewarding and motivation inducing. Um, and the motivation to engage in the behavior is strong, but because it is centrally rewarded, it is not responsible, responsive at all to being turned off once the reward is felt. So we can train these animals to bar press to get the reward and they'll continue to bar press even though the reward has been delivered in response to the work. So they don't get satisfied, they don't get satiated as a result of it. 
and they then will bar press compulsively and the bar pressing to get this stimulation centrally will compete with and reduce the salience of other life-sustaining behaviors. So they'll bar press in preference to eating, drinking, socializing, engaging in intercourse with other little laboratory animals. They will bar press and exclude the other kinds of things that we generally find rewarding. There is a robust reward because of the direct activation that happens in the brain. Now, when we generally have a, a behavior induced in order to get a reward that is of these other types in humans, not directly in the, in the central nervous system, we generally are responding to a call to engage in the behavior to get the reward that's based upon um, a sensation that's coming in through the peripheral nervous system. So for example, our stomach is empty and that gets translated up to the brain. Oh, my stomach is empty. It may be growling. You know, I want to put something in there. My blood sugar is low. That's being perceived in places and the message is being communicated to the brain and the brain is saying, I need to go about engaging in some behaviors that are going to give me some food so I can turn off my hunger. Because the message is initiated through things that travel through the peripheral nervous system, right? It takes processing to understand what the drive is. And then, because it is, there is an unmet need or desire that set off the cascade of behavior that led to the feeding, once I'm fed, I can be satisfied. Unless there's something wrong in my satisfaction system. Right? You can, in fact, have an eating disorder and eat compulsively, eat without paying attention to whether you're satiated or satisfied, and eat when you're not hungry, and have that be part of not having your uh, system to set off the drive and the reward are not paired. They've been uncoupled in your brain for one reason or another. But for most people, most of the people in the room, present company excluded, because I'm one of those eater, eaters that doesn't get turned off in that way. Um, once you meet the drive and it's satisfied, you stop. And there is clear and compelling evidence that the things that are initiated peripherally are more easily satisfied, but the things that are initiated centrally don't get turned off. Now, why am I pausing there? Because the brain is activated by the chemicals, and the chemicals act in the same way that these centrally motivated bar pressing things act in the lab animals, so taking cocaine or taking heroin. So there's a saying in drug using circles, the more you do, the more you do, right? You don't get satisfied. The more you do, the more you want. The more you do, the more you do, the more you stay, the more you stay. So you don't, it doesn't get turned off in the same way that a peripherally initiated unmet need sets off a cascade of behaviors. Once you meet the need, then the desire is turned off. For drugs, it doesn't get turned off. Deprivation states also drive instinctual and motivated behaviors to satisfy the need. Now, Dysfunction in these circuits leads to very characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. And this is um, out of the ASAM patient placement criteria, where we describe six dimensions that get evaluated to determine how severe a person's disease is. How many people are familiar with the ASAM patient placement criteria? Oh, okay. So I'll pause on this a little bit and, and just unpack it. So the first dimension is acute intoxication or withdrawal. We want to know whether the person is acutely intoxicated and what's the risk to them if they go from the intoxicated state they're in down to a blood level of zero. Some people will have life-threatening withdrawal. Other substances are uncomfortable, but you can monitor them safely without medical interventions. Um, or if the person is in withdrawal, how long will it take them to return to as near as makes no difference normal functioning, biological functioning? So you know that alcohol withdrawal is life-threatening. Opioid withdrawal is uncomfortable. They may be sweating, vomiting, um, but unless there is an unborn fetus, 
generally people don't die of opioid withdrawal. They may not stay with you through it <laughs> if you don't address it, but they're not going to die from it. BM is biomedical conditions or complications. What has come about in them that needs to be addressed either acutely or over time as they get returned to as near as makes no difference normal. So if there's acute loss of life or, or limb, ASAM says they need to go to a hospital first before they start treatment. Emotional behavior conditions or complications looks at broadly whether there's a mood disorder, an anxiety disorder, a thought disorder, some impulsivity, or a risk of suicidality. And generally, in addition to sort of scanning those five broad areas to determine whether the person needs something more than straight chemical dependency counseling, we want to know whether that person has been exposed to something traumatic or violent at some point in their past because we'll want to start working with that material immediately uh, upon engagement and treatment. Now, there are people who have a school of thought that you got to get sober for us to really work on that stuff. I've never met somebody who could make it through treatment with trauma who, where it hasn't emerged in treatment. So good luck for holding it together for two years before you go work on your trauma, right? I don't know how you get two years of sobriety if you don't work on your trauma. So um, the other three things are what treatment's made of. Treatment acceptance or resistance is the sum total of your insight and compliance. Relapse potential as your symptomatology and your skills to deal with the symptoms. And then uh, recovery environment is your structure and support. And the structure and support is made up of the people, places, and things. A person who has a high degree of insight but doesn't follow instructions may know why they're in treatment, but they don't benefit from it because they can't surrender to the guidance of the professional. A person who's, who, you know, so somebody who may come in and say, I know I'm a heroin addict, but then does nothing to change anything about that. Somebody who is really compliant, you know you're dealing with them if they don't have insight because they do everything you ask them to do, but they don't seem to benefit from it. And you see your counseling staff working harder and harder to come up with a set of things that they need to be engaged in. And they're really proud of how compliant the patient is, but the patient's not getting any better. So you have to have both insight and compliance in order to have movement. Um, high symptomatology with little skills acquisition or application um, means that somebody may in fact respond to the symptoms and they go out and use again. Um, and they need to acquire some skills to deal with craving, which is an opportunistic disease. And then structure and support is made up of people, places, and things. So all of that stuff is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward or relief of symptoms by substance use and other behaviors. Pathological is altered or caused by disease with a diminished recognition of the significant problems with one's behavior and interpersonal relationships and being such to a degree that is extreme, excessive, or markedly abnormal. Addiction is characterized by an inability to consistently abstain impairment in behavioral control, craving, and diminished recognition of problems with one's own behavior or in your relationships. So at initiation, dopamine and release is triggered by the reinforcing substance, and it's critical for the acute re reward. So dopamine is released by all things that create rewards in the brain. But the dopamine that's released in response to the chemicals that one uses is 10 to 100 times that which is released by eating a pleasurable meal, drinking a fine wine, or having an orgasm with sex. The maintenance of the behavior results from cellular adaptations that happen in the anterior cingulate, this is the second time I'm going to mention it, and orbital frontal glutamatergic projections through the nucleus accumbens. So there are adaptations that take place uh, from the nucleus accumbens, which is the primitive area of the brain, to the um, um, executive control center. And these adaptations, they get used to having the dopamine being released and being there, uh, which continues to uh, support the behavior. So that you get changes in the excitatory transmission in these projections. And they reduce the capacity of this executive control center, the prefrontal frontal cortex,
to initiate other behaviors in response to biological rewards. So everything else that the, the brain might tell you to do in order to sustain life isn't as salient or as important as engaging in activities to get money, to get the drug, to use the drug, to recover from the use of the drug, to use the drug again. And in fact, most people don't recover from the use of the drug. They actually have a drop in the blood level, which as it nears the lower border boundary below which they'll experience withdrawal, as they get, start approaching that level, they anticipate that they're gonna go into withdrawal and they get very engaged in behaviors to get the blood level up again. And in fact, people will, you know, if they're injecting or smoking a pipe or smoking a joint or drinking alcohol, the question really isn't, why does the person use the first one? It's why does the person drink the 15th drink? After you're intoxicated, why do you drive the blood level up even more? If you have a, a needle in your arm and you're injecting heroin, the person tends to leave the needle in and push a little bit more and push a little bit more because they're really trying to titrate up to the upper border boundary where they're experiencing the highest level of high without experiencing a fatal overdose. So there's a teasing towards the upper border boundary and sometimes wanting to exceed the upper border boundary if we can do so safely and also trying to stay away from the lower border boundary. And those are just two made up words of mine, which I use to describe the zone of indifference, you know, in terms of the endpoints of the zone of indifference. If you can stay between the upper border boundary and the lower border boundary, you can stay in an area where you're not in withdrawal and you're not overdosing and you have a certain level of consciousness and awareness of being high. So there is a loss of salience for everything else. So where can we strengthen these systems? Well, we can do things to block the effect of chemicals so that if people initiate, they don't get high. And there are people looking to develop you know, things to block the effect of drugs, antibodies for people. We can look to strengthen the system during maintenance. So how do we get somebody to stop? And anyone who's ever smoked, knows that, that people stop smoking a lot. The challenge isn't stopping smoking, it's staying quit. So as Terry Reston, who used to write about smoking cessation a lot, used to say, it's, it's to quit and stay quit. How do we get people who quit to stay quit? Or to block the response at the receptor when they're decided not to use, so that if they do use, they don't get high anymore or to blunt the response at the receptor and to curtail reinstatement or relapse. And many of you know that for a while now we've been uh, using substances with alcohol where we are blocking opioid receptors basically, but people who reinitiate on alcohol say to themselves, huh, this just doesn't feel the way it used to. So they're not getting the same reward and so maybe they can wear themselves out from initiating. And often with people who are trying to get to stop smoking cigarettes, we'll use a medication and tell them, don't even set a stop date, but one day you'll wake up and you'll be lighting a cigarette and you'll wonder, why am I lighting the cigarette? So there are medications that we're using to try to blunt the response to curtail the, re the reinstatement of the relapse. I thought when I got up here I should have turned that fan to face me, but I thought it was more compassionate to let it face you, but I'm burning up <laughs> with the lights on this corner. All right, so... What about the executive controls? So there are cellular adaptations in the brain that promote the compulsivity. So there's the decreased value of the natural rewards. There's diminished cognitive control, so we have less choice over what we're gonna do. And there's an enhanced glutamatergic drive in response to the drug-associated stimuli so that the cues, drug-using cues, trigger behavior. And what we found is that Cues that suggest that the drugs are here or the drugs are available are more able to set off a cascade of behaviors towards getting drugs are than withdrawal. The fact that you know that drugs are available is, is more important to setting off cascade of behavior to get the drug than being in withdrawal. 
aha, thank you. <laughs> it's like, and I couldn't really take my sweater off because the mic is attached to it, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so the executive controls, this brain, the big brain that we have, the control is lost. And you see the drug seeking is more salient than other drugs. And the prefrontal cortex is hyper responsive to the stimuli that predict the availability of drugs. So craving is an opportunistic disease. And that's not me saying that. Alan Lechner used to say craving was an opportunistic disease, meaning that the longer you are from your last use, the more likely you are to experience a high degree of craving frequently. However, if you are in a situation where the drugs are available, craving will return with the same vigor that you experienced it with before you stopped using. So let's assume that if you put somebody in jail, they can't get drugs. Let's just fantasize for a moment. <laughs> If you are locked up, the frequency and intensity of craving diminishes over time because you're not able to act on it. But if you get out and you're walking home and you go down the same street where you used to go to cop drugs before you went to jail, being on that same block, craving returns at a high frequency and a high intensity. So craving is somewhat opportunistic. And it is more often to occur, now I think I'm getting wind on my microphone, there. It's more often likely to occur when you're able to act on it. It actually diminishes in frequency and intensity when you're less able to act on it. So what did I say in all of that? Let me just pause for a minute. Dopamine release feels good and it changes the brain. Because it feels good, the things that we do to get it re released are repeated. So we eat when hungry, drink when thirsty, engage in intercourse when aroused and appropriate, um, when we're in appropriate settings for that. Um, so the things that, that dopamine gets released by are things that feel good to us. And because it feels good, it's designed to feel good because it's designed to cause us to engage in the behaviors that perpetuate the life of the individual and the species. There are some other things that are species bound that may not be as closely associated with dopamine. Guilt is one of them. Uh, guilt is something that is intended to create cohesion of the species. So um, um, it may not be as tied to dopamine, but cohesion of the species ensures greater survival of the individuals in that species. You know? So if you think about an African savanna and a bunch of eland running across the savanna and the lions running, you know, they're in a pack, the lion's going to pick up the weaker ones around the outside, the periphery, the slower ones. It's like that, that old joke, I don't have to run faster than the lion, I just have to run faster than you. <laughs> so, so, you know, it picks up the, the weaker ones, but the cohesion of the species means the survival of the species. Um, with, while dopamine creates changes in many areas of the brain, change in certain areas are common to all types of substance use leading to the disorder. So when we look at opioids, I'm trying to figure out. When we look at opioids, when we look at cocaine, there's a lot of overlap in where these actions take place in the brain, in, in the primitive area of the brain, and, and then the projections to the executive control center are common. So in the end, changes in functions that support drug use are more powerful than the drive to do almost anything else. Everything else loses salience. So when you ask yourself, why would you knowingly use drugs if you know that if you're caught using drugs, you're going to lose your freedom? Well, that's a pretty complex thought to interfere with a behavior that is connected to a basic instinct to survive, right? The fact that I might not have housing in the future is going to keep me from using a drug now. So I had the occasion when I was at ONDCP to read all the legislation that, that, that undergirded all of our drug laws. The, you know, the loss of scholarships, to teenagers who smoked weed, 
the loss of public housing, the people who got arrested who lived in public housing, and you know, so on and so forth. And the debates on the floor of Congress were filled with these assumptions that people could think and reason themselves out of the behavior. You know, in fact, our FDA schedules drugs like opioids at a lower schedule if they're mixed with Tylenol because they assume that the person who would take an excess of them would restrain themselves because of a risk of Tylenol to their liver. Think about it. I, you know, I've never known anybody who's restraining themselves from injecting for a risk of HIV. How are they going to restrain themselves from taking a drug because it might have effect on their liver? And they don't know whether it's going to have an effect on the liver. So the, in the end, the, the desire to use drugs is so mar powerfully motivated and connected to the need to survive that you cannot think and reason yourself out of a behavior. So the primary behavioral pathology is an overpowering motivational strength to approach and consume or use the drug and a decreased ability to control the desire to obtain the drugs. With a reduced capacity of your brain to initiate behaviors in response to biological rewards. So you will stop eating, right? And use the drugs. You will use your money for drugs rather than use your money for foods. And there's a reduced capacity of this thinking brain, this executive control center, to provide executive control over the drug seeking. So you don't avoid danger. And it's hyper-responsive to stimuli, which predicts drug availability. And once it gets turned on by the stimuli that predicts the drug ability, it drives the behavior associated with getting the drug. Like other chronic diseases, addiction often involves cycles of relapse and remission. And relapse is not necessary. I was in a thing this morning where people were talking about the problem with our field is that we treat people and they relapse time and time and time again after treatment. And I don't know if what I see after treatment is a relapse. If a person has just been standing on their head for 28 days and all they've done is they say, I'm not gonna use now under these controlled circumstances, um, but as soon as I get out of here, I'm gonna use again. So I don't think it's a relapse unless the person acknowledges that they have the disease they commit to recovery and they reduce or eliminate inducements to use. It's a matter of thinking, feeling, and acting as a result of treatment. If somebody just did a 28-day stint or even a 98-day stint, 90-day stint, and they had every intention of using after you let them go, that's not a relapse. That's just continued use with a break, a forced break, right? And I don't see a lot of my peers actually evaluating what's happening as a result of the treatment episode. I see a lot of my peers telling people what's wrong with them <coughs> while they're there, but not allowing people to develop an insight. And I use that word insight before. An insight in my mind is recognition that a problem exists paired with a desire to remedy it. So my telling you and browbeating you with the knowledge that I have an insight into you and your problem and this is your problem and this is what you've got to do about your problem gets you nowhere. You know, if you don't feel safe enough to experience an insight of your own and have one and then share that with me, I've gotten nowhere with you. You know, if you, if you leave treatment and all, and all I've done is browbeat you for 30 days into to accepting my world view of you, you haven't had treatment. You have not acknowledged addiction, committed to recovery, and reduced or eliminated inducements to use. So I always go back to a woman who came into treatment. She was living with an alcohol-using boyfriend. And the staff at my program wanted to really get on her about, you can't go back there after treatment. You know, that's going to be a horrible situation for you to recover in. And what are you supposed to do on your first day of treatment except for defend whatever decisions you've been making up until that time. If I jump on you about your boyfriend's drinking at home and not creating a substance abuse free environment, a safe environment for you, then all you're going to do is defend the decisions that you've been making. At some point in her second month of treatment, she had an insight and she said, I'm you know, feeling at peace with the universe. This feels good. I like the way I'm feeling. 
and it's really going to be hard to maintain this state. If I come home from work one day after a hard day at work and he's sitting on the other end of the couch cracking open a beer, she had her own insight into her circumstances, which was much more effective for her to make a decision to change things about where she was going home to than if I had been for the last 60 days telling her she couldn't live with him. All that was going to do was drive a wedge between me and her and make it impossible for her to feel safe enough to have an insight into what kind of environment she needed to be in. And in fact, she wanted to replicate the environment of treatment back home because it had been useful for her to create the, the, the sense of safety and peace that wasn't driven by substances. So she looked around and did an analysis of what it was like at home and made a decision to reduce or eliminate inducements to use. And her inducement to use at home was a boyfriend who didn't want to stop drinking. She said she couldn't be with him trying to be a sober woman. So this overpower motivational strength which reduces or eliminates our ability to control the desire leaves us with a pathology of motivation and choice. We're motivated to use our choices are limited and a disease of learning and memory because it is through this very classical learning theory that uh, the, the drive to use is reinforced because it is associated with a memory that is euphoric joy. And it releases dopamine and it reinforces the behaviors that we engage in in order to get that euphoric joy. And I don't know, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be convinced that that euphoric joy, um, you know, is experienced, um, you know, if, if you can forget that that's what the experience on the other side of it is. In addition, for an end stage addict, even the person in post acute withdrawal who's insomnic, irritable, and is unable to concentrate, they know that by resuming use, that state is immediately alleviated by the use. So you gotta have something in there that's much more powerful than that, which motivates the behaviors going forward. Um, there's stress, not of adverse life events in the lives of people who have addiction, adverse life events in the lives of people before they ever use a substance. Um, these adverse life events can increase impulsivity and uh, a state of feeling a deficit or a need. And things like conflict, interpersonal conflict, incarceration, and homelessness are other things that um, are adverse life events. The problem with people who have an addiction is a sort of reversal learning problem where they do the same thing over and over again expecting different results or they perseverate in the behaviors that are creating and making these adverse life events more common and occur more often. Um, we do know that there are research findings that support our observation that the gray matter deficits, um, which are in the brains of individuals who've been exposed to an a, a lot of adverse life events worsen in, uh, with conflicts in motivation and choice. And um, there is damage to the frontal lobe inhibitory systems that would sort of rein in those excitatory behaviors that get set off by the cascade. Individuals who have been exposed to a number of adverse life events have uh, deficits in their frontal lobe that they're also trying to overcome. Stress and cues can increase drug seeking and impulsivity but there may be medications which can affect these mechanisms. Um, so we might try to modulate the dopamine system to make dopamine more available um, or dampen the power of stress which creates the response. So changing the way we respond to stress. So you can do it through beta blockers which would dampen the fight or flight response or benzodiazepines, not my first go-to as an addiction physician, I'm not one to write benzos, but many of my peers do. Um, and the benzos are really great for treating anxiety because not only does it make the person more chill, but there's a signal that the medicine is on board and working. 
And people who have anxiety disorders who've been treated with benzos are very difficult to get off of them because everything else that we might use for them, which dampens the response and even blocks some of the stress that they feel, d will not give the same signal that a benzodiazepine gives. So benzodiazepines, in my mind, are the last drug that I would choose. You know, not only because it's alcohol in a pill form, right? But because once I get someone accustomed to using it for an anxiety disorder, getting them on anything else is near impossible because nothing else gives them a signal. Yes, sir. question is, do I use gabapentin in my practice? And I do in patients that I'm seeing for pain without addiction, but I don't use gabapentin in my practice with people who have a dependence, a substance use disorder, because the, um, it's also quite uh, reinforcing. It has a great signal and it's one that people seek. So I'm, um, my practice with people with a substance use disorder is to not to try to find a solution in a little white pill, a little white something. So in patients with pain, I like to work on multiple gates. I have a pain blog if you want to read about that. But in patients with a substance use disorder, with or without pain, I tend to uh, not get to medications, if at all. Um, I see we're coming down to the end, so I want to talk, I'm going to go forward a little bit. Oh, hmm. without treatment or engagement in recovery. Activities, addiction is progressive and can result in disability or premature death. So how do we get people into recovery? Stop using and change everything about yourself. Now, I'm very serious about that. When, when you, you heard me say that I don't use the little white things for people who have a substance use disorder, I don't use the little white things for people with a substance use disorder. Um, I need to make sure that they have a safe place to begin to make these changes about themselves and what does making changes about yourself mean? Um, so here's the tools that I use to improve treatment. Abstinence, I help people understand and practice universal abstinence. It avoids the priming. Um, I look at what medications they're on when they get to me. Everybody has tried to change the way their neurotransmitters are working. Everybody has seen one of my uh, prescription writing peers and they've complained about something that we have a little white pill for. And what you complain about when you're actively addicted is different than what you'll complain about when you're off all substances. So what you've been given when you're actively addicted, some of it might need to be continued, but much of it doesn't. And I, always, I have a saying about treatment, you can be at your worst in treatment. So I can pull you off everything and unless you're actively suicidal, I can leave you off of everything until we get a good sense of what you look like on nothing. Now, you can't do that everywhere or under all circumstances, but if you've got somebody in a 30-day residential stay, you can do a lot of that. You can figure out what medications are really going to be needed. Um, and then anything that you use early in recovery for symptom reduction, because that's, you know, you've got to reduce symptoms enough for them to be mobilized enough to engage in treatment. Anything that you might start somebody on in early recovery, you want to look at again six months down the road to see if it needs to continue. Um, peer support to create cohesion and identification to support their ability to identify, own, and express one's feeling most important part of treatment is identifying, owning, and expressing one's feelings. People don't come in prepared to do that, you know, and in fact we do a lot of work that's cognitive before we do emotional work because cognitive work is less threatening than emotional work, but if you're not starting to work at a feelings level in treatment at some point, we got to figure out why we haven't been able to get you there. Um, professional guidance to bond with a professional, practice surrender, 
I mean, we know that people are progressing in treatment when we say, you know, we need you to do some of this, and they say, Shh, okay, I'll try that, rather than why, why would I do that? You know, if, if you can't practice some, if you're not demonstrating that you can surrender your will in that relationship, you need a lot more treatment still. Um, and, and professional guidance to help the person gain insight. Not being told what I think is going on with them, but uh, an opportunity for them to step back and figure out what's going on with them. Exercise for restoration and protection, diet for restoration and protection, and ritual. Using a wide range of activi activities and a schedule. We use the schedule to support change and normalize their circadian and ultradian rhythms. And I'm serious that one of the things that staff that work with me do is that if you're in a residential setting, we want to know if after breakfast you went to your bathroom and you evacuated your bowels. I don't know that many programs are concerned about the schedule of your bowel movements, but I am because everybody comes in either constipated or dry or not having fed. And one of the earliest signs that your circadian rhythms are being restored is that when you put food in your stomach, there is a gastrocolic reflex and you want to evacuate your bowels. If I can get you doing that early in treatment, I know that some of your biological functions are being restored to as near as makes no difference normal. So it, when I first told my staff we were going to do that, they were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and we now go around, everybody has you know, the bathroom, we go around to make sure that people are making their way to their bathroom after breakfast. And we don't put pressure on you until you do because we know you're not ready to start to take a deeper dive into how you feel if you're still constipated. So what is recovery? Um, if addiction is characterized by an inability to consistently abstain, it's an impairment of behavioral control, craving, diminished recognition of significant problems with one's behavior and interpersonal relationships, and a dysfunctional emotional response, recovery should look different than that. And of a group of responders in long-term recovery who were questioned about this said that recovery was authenticity, emotional competence, healthy relationships, a right-sizing of ego and spirituality, and attention to neuroadaptation. So how do you get from addiction to recovery? You develop authenticity, become emotionally competent, gain healthy relationships, practice spirituality and ego awareness, address the neuroadaptation, and heal developmental trauma. That wasn't listed by them, but to me, that's an important component of recovery. So how do you measure authenticity? Well, if you're not authentic with people, you're kind of guarded. If you're authentic, you're more vulnerable and honest. Um, so you don't see a cute, angry, demanding, private person, but you see a real individual who's benign and giving and open. And instead of avoiding their feelings, they're open and vulnerable. And the step work for authenticity is in step six and seven for people who do 12-step facilitated work. Emotional competence. Rather than guilt and shame, there is self-acceptance unconditional positive regard, an expression of feelings, and embracing of feelings as information. I have a saying that I started around my program that feelings are fact. The therapists around me were like, what? We're taught not to trust our feelings. And I'm like, well, feelings are the only things that are not processed, right? So when I say, you know, uh, how do you feel? And somebody says, I feel like, or I feel that, we now are processing feelings. They're thoughts, they're not feelings. And if we can get to feelings, and most of us can, if we can get to feelings, we can begin to understand who we are. And we have to stay at, down at a feelings level rather than getting in a thought level. By the time we process a feeling, it start, starts to lose its authenticity and its validity because you're filtering it through something. So we try to keep people identifying, owning, and expressing feelings. So an expression of feelings, embracing the feelings as information. And the step work for doing feelings work is in four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Healthy relationships, holding people with unconditional positive regard rather than loving conditionally, 
creating intimacy. I always tell my husband, if he ever leaves me, I am not getting into another relationship because I don't have another concession or, con or confession in me. Uh, con the confessions are the intimacy in the relationship, letting somebody know who you really are, and the concessions are the harmony, letting him leave the toilet seat up. <laughs> right? <laughs> So in order to have relationships, we need confessions and concessions. And in order to have confessions, we need intimacy. Uh, learning where I stop and you begin, confusion about boundaries. And you'll hear people say, I'm setting a boundary. They're actually setting limits. Boundaries are natural. They're, it's a nat it's, you know, boundaries just are. And if you grew up in a household where people didn't respect boundaries, you find yourself having to set limits with them, right? And you don't really have a sense of what your own natural boundaries are because people didn't respect them. But I always try to teach people about boundaries and limits. And sometimes when you have people in your life who don't respect your boundary, you got to set a limit with them and put them out of your life. You know, and you gotta, you, you know, but you've got to learn about where I stop and where you begin and to make sure that you have people in your life who respect where you stop. Vulnerability, because you can't be vulnerable with people who don't. <laughs> respect where you stop, right? Uh, embracing your feelings as information, regulation of your feelings, and uh, reliability. Not making fluid commitments, but being reliable. Step work is listed there for you. What are the measures of spirituality? Accepting a higher authority rather than being the highest authority. A concern for the welfare of others rather than being self-centered. A moderation of your appetites rather than an indulgence in your appetites creating win-win behaviors rather than win-lose and always having to win. And the step work for that is in 6, 7, 10, and 12. And then neuroadaptation, not using rather than using, changing people, places, and things, and leaving seductive people, places, and things alone. And the step work for that is 1, 2, 3, 11, and 12. So there are lots of potential treatments for brain recovery preventing the reaction to the exposure, psychosocial therapies, creating the repair, and then medications for the comorbidity. Sometimes the comorbidity underlies the behavior. You know, you will have people who are depressed who know that their mood would be lifted by certain substances. You do have people who have ADD adult residual type who find their focus improved with a stimulant. There are a few adults who can get the uh, paradoxical effect from a stimulant. But it's better to have the medications rather than drugs for those things. And when I find people who are using their ADD meds in order to increase their focus around task-oriented things, I find people without ADD, right? Because you need a stable blood level. With every medication, you have to have the diagnosis, the drug at the right dose, for a particular period of time before it's effective. And using it off and on like that is using a drug, not using a medication. So psychosocial therapy support abstinence, retrain the brain, retools the emotional brain, offers a range of interventions and builds responsibility and better judgment, and is almost always available if done through 12-step recovery. Medications in combination with counseling we talked about you want to treat the pleasure survival system and the cortical decision-making system with counseling and therapies, providing wherever possible access to ritual and soothing balms. Again, it's got to feel good. People aren't going to stay with you if they feel miserable. And finally, let's go a little forward. So on the opioid front, in the few minutes we have left, there are those who believe in fixing the receptor where we repair the impaired receptors and restore to as near as makes no different normal functioning of the receptor. Um, people who are looking to fix the receptor are people who are looking for long-term psychosocial therapies, um, retraining the brain, retooling the brain, maybe 12-step facilitated therapy, and uh, not exposing the receptor to any drugs, but abstinence-based, drug-free, fix the receptor, and go forth and use no more. There are people who believe in filling the receptor, substituting a similar molecule and patching the deficit. 
So methadone and buprenorphine would be medications of that type. It leaves the receptor in an on-on response. There's restoration to as near as makes no difference to a lot of other bodily um, functions and so forth, but the underlying the addiction is maintained and if you were to take that out of the receptor, the person would resume using uh, their drug of choice. And then there's a huge movement in the United States to block the receptor. Uh, it's a competitive blockade to impede, obstruct, or stymie the desire to use. So you put a drug or medication in the receptor that um, the person can't use enough drugs to override it. So the receptor's blocked. And presumably, if they're getting their, taking their pill on a daily basis or getting their injection once a month, they won't use heroin again. So I ask you to think about all that we've talked about, about how uh, complicated it is to be um, abstinent if there's one preference that you have over another. Your hand was up, sir. Yeah, look, the, um, the blocking treatment. I mean, I know in, in the sort of, sorry, the blocking treatment, I know in... In chimpanzee brain development, uh, Regina Pally did this experiment with naltraxone. The brain's never developed. Um, and I wonder, if, if you give somebody naltraxone as a blocker, don't you leave them in a state of anhedonia and, and prevent recovery happening? Well, that's a very good question. And if you look at the early studies that were done at Yale, the two populations who were adherent to the medication were doctors who were threatened with loss of, lic loss of licensure if they didn't stay on the medicine because it kept them from you know, being tempted to use fentanyl in the operating room, say, and people who were in the trials from the criminal justice system because if they participated in the trials from the criminal justice system, they might get early release. Um, the rest of the people opted not to stay on the medicine. So um, that avenue of thought was not fully developed as to why were those the two populations that would stay on the medicine. Uh, but as it gains more and more traction now, people are, are wondering, are we going to, in fact, observe individuals who are on the medicine who have anhedonia, who can't get a normal range of emotional responses, and um, is it worth being off opioids to be in that state? And we don't have the answer to the question yet. We do know that it performs as well as buprenorphine, as well as abstinence-based treatment, but we have a lot of unanswered questions, and that's probably my number one question. Yes, sir. I just wondering uh, whether cognitive or affective neuroscientific research, how are, um, how are the receptors, how are neurotransmission receptors measured? For example, a classic one is a patient came to see me the other day, my doctor told me it was a classic one. Could we have the mic? So, that, yeah, as I so think his question has. My, doc, my doctor told me my serotonin levels are too low. Now, of course, the, the, the doctor didn't measure the serotonin. Is it, is it mainly through blood tests, or, or how do you measure it as neuroscientists? How do you measure whether someone has a high? I mean, this great sort of pharmaceutical line, line about having, having uh, you know, the. the, the uh, low chemical um, imbalance, chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. And then you don't know what a, we don't even know, I don't know whether anyone in the room does know what a chemical balance is. I certainly don't. But what is a chemical imbalance to neuroscientists? And what is a chemical balance to neuroscientists? How do you measure it, in other words, is what I'm saying? Our only measures in clinical treatment is how someone functions. Can't, so, you can't measure, you, apart from MRI scanning, and well, I understand all that. And, and MRI scanning is probably a tick off from really understanding what we're seeing. We, there's a suggestion that we know what we're seeing, and there are certain patterns that we see, and there are surrogates for brain activity. So you can see brain activity, and there are surrogates for brain activity in terms of the glucose that's being consumed in certain areas, so we know they're more active. But we haven't completely mapped that. We know that there are patterns that are similar to animal models um, you know, with certain drugs, but we have not completely mapped that either. So we're in an area of science fiction when we're reading MRIs, functional MRIs still, right? It's, it's still in the realm of science and research and not clinical medicine. Yeah, to be, got you. To I'll be, say the same with neuropeptides. Right, to yeah. be quite honest. Yeah. So what we do in, you know, in terms of clinical medicine 
is you listen to a person's reports, their self-reports, right? And some of our patients are very good at putting together a string of complaints, which would be the symptoms, that would trigger us to believe that they have a, a, a particular syndrome or disease, right? They're very educated in that regard. So we listen to their complaints and we look for signs and we come up with what our best guess is, right? And then you test your hypothesis. But that's the reason you see people repeatedly, to see if they're getting better to the degree and in the direction that you would have predicted based upon your response. Thank you very much. You're the most honest clinician I've ever met. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just not there yet. <laughs> um, you mentioned that um, the prefrontal cortex gets damaged by drugs uh, addiction and also by mental health issues. Does that repair itself? So, uh, more specifically, I said that we know that there are deficits in the prefrontal cortex and the gray matter when people have been repeatedly exposed to trauma. Using the same studies we were just talking about where we're kind of in you know, science and not clinical medicine yet, but we know that it's there. And there are good animal models that are surrogates for understanding the human brain. Um, but I would say that it, if, if you follow people in recovery, as near as makes no difference, <laughs> to normality you can be returned to, right? To as near as makes no difference to normality. And that's kind of what we desire for most diseases or disorders, that it gets restored to as near as makes no difference. Without normality. necessarily being able to measure that scientifically. Right, and we, we then measure it through a variety of surrogates, you know? Yes, over time we measure it to a variety of surrogates. Um, but you know, they've followed a number of people. One I reported to, there's another guy out of Boston. Oh God, what's his last name? If you give me your card, I'll send you, it's McAuliffe out of Boston. And he's put together a, a manual for treating people both with alcohol and cocaine through like 48 or 64 sessions. And he interviewed a bunch of people at 10 years of sobriety and they're, responses were very similar to this other study that I quoted here. Um, when you follow people out who have a mature recovery, um, there are a number of indicators of that maturity of that recovery. And the only thing different from them and NORPS, normal, ordinary, responsible people without the dis disorder, is that they don't drink or use, and NORPS can, but they feel like they don't, they cannot jeopardize the functioning of their, what's been restored to normal in their brain by exposing it again to these little bits that prime taking off again. And you know, I mean, the, I, I ran through those slides and anybody that wants the slides, you can give me your card and I'll send it to you. I ran through those slides, but this, this notion of <clears throat> being exposed to a small amount of a substance, even after many, many years of abstinence, and being off and running was alluded to by the people who wrote the big book, where they say the disease progresses even when you're not using. And there's now scientific evidence of much of what they wrote about, and what they wrote from was a collective experience. Thank you. Yes, thank you. The, the question here is that, and, and in fact, you can, why don't you quote it, Ann Geller's work endorses the changes that persist for many years, but are they functional or histological? And the answer, I think the lady was looking for, and I do want you to answer, what's the functional deficit? And the functional deficits get reduced. There may be histological changes. So go ahead. No, I just uh, agree. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ann Geller is, was a, you know, one of my mentors. She's a giant in ASAM who was a, a neuroscientist who went into addiction treatment. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. And I'm a, a, um, a, a nutritionist, so I was super pleased to hear you talking about um, doing stool tests or, you know, checking people's when they go to the loo. 
Um, I wanted to ask you about um, the microbiome and your understanding and thoughts on inflammation in the gut and how that affects depression and mental health issues. Not at all qualified. Sure. No, but if you want to make a comment for the group, please do. Well, I, I just think that inflammation in the gut, I've seen time and time again when people come and see me with depression and eating disorders and other addictions, and every time I do a stool test on them, there is some sort of inflammation in the gut, and that when you treat the gut, then it, it makes such a huge difference to their mental health. Um, and I just, you know, even the fact about them, that when people pass a stool, that is one of the main questions I ask people, because it has got such a huge effect on how they feel, what, the, what they're consuming, and how it's, how it's being... Um, how it's being relieved. Well, I have a very elaborate meal plan that people who are under my control <laughs> are asked to adhere to, and uh, many of them resist adhering to it initially, but the longer they're structured and supported by us, the, the better they adhere to the program, and it involves six small feedings, and I had to cobble all this together because there's no real good literature that deals with nutrition and mental health or substance abuse issues. So I cobbled this all together over time and from, you know, really working with stuff like the circadian and ultradian rhythms. But I'm, I'm really interested in seeing if anybody knows about the starvation approach to feeding now because um, there's a movement afoot not to eat when the sun is not overhead and to have these long periods of non-feeding. I do, I do six feedings a day in, in, in my treatment programs, and uh, I do a wake-up um, carbohydrate, um, three to four ounces of a fruit-based smoothie uh, to wake people up, um, a heavy um, protein-based breakfast, a mid-morning snack, a full dinner at lunch, a mid-afternoon snack, and then a smaller meal in the evening, and nothing after um, 8 o'clock unless I have someone with middle of the night wakening, and then I give them six almonds for the bedside. And, and so, because some people do wake up from hypoglycemia, and I want just enough to not bring them to full consciousness uh, and so forth. I probably should put some almond butter there and then they wouldn't have to chew those almonds. But I, I'm, I'm interested if anybody knows anything about starvation diet because I'm interested in you know, trying to incorporate new things as it relates to diet and recovery. And I figure what I teach somebody because I have control over them, they're gonna keep some part of it when they go home. And if I give them a really good shot at being able to maintain something that's not too difficult, um, you know, the thing that it took to get you into recovery are the things you should continue. And you should ask yourself, if I'm not going to do something that I was doing while I was in treatment, is it worth not doing? What am I, what, what am I potentially going to lose? So I'd be interested to exchange Super cards to with talk. you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And just one other quick question, just in terms of serotonin uptake. What's your take on genetic testing? Do you have any thoughts on that and the pathways? that people are doing now? It's not there yet. No. It's not there yet for me clinically. For, yeah, I understand. Uh, you know, if I have a patient that has been through a variety of meds for anxiety yeah. or something and not a good response and I know they were taking them, yeah. you'd be surprised how many people, if I put them on daily observed dosing, get better on the meds that I'm prescribing and they never got better on anything before. So if, if I know that they're taking them and they're not getting better, then I will do genetic testing to see if there are some particular issues. And I have some patients who uh, are quite sensitive to opioids but have pain that have to be treated, and I can maybe target a better opioid for them that causes them to be less sick. But in general, sure. the, the stuff that I'm doing is so gross and clinical yeah. that uh, a lot of the science is not for clinical medicine yet, no, you know? I'm, and that's just sort of where I am. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> there was another comment up front, and then I guess we'd better let you go. That's probably best the last one, yeah. <coughs> first of all, you addressed my first question. I want the slides, thank you very much. Okay. And um, <coughs> just a comment about nutrition. I agree, it's so important. We're finding that the inflammatory process and you know cytokines, um, are responsible for the, the sickness behavior, whether it be um, 
um, the sickness symptoms or the behavioral symptoms that we see in depression. So I agree, treating the gut, um, you know, definitely directly impacts the, the symptoms of depression. Um, the, the question I had, um, and I checked, I think I can say all three of us kind of have this question. Um, I, I love the way you unpacked um, the pathophysiology and just wondering if there's any contrast with, with gambling uh, addiction, if you can comment on that. Oh, I, a absolutely. Um, any of the process behaviors, we used to at ASAM not include them. We actually thought they kind of trivialized the concept of an addiction. Bye. Thank you both for coming. We actually thought that they it trivialized our concept of addiction. But all of this, these, these processes, which in fact lead to the reward, are just as powerful as if someone were taking a chemical. There may be maybe more peripheral mediation, but the payoff is still central. It's the dopamine release payoff that's still very central. And it doesn't get satisfied. Now, there are people who would start to argue, sometimes we use sex addiction when we just have somebody who, um, uh, you know, doesn't restrain their behavior. Um, it would be back here on ego. What, um, unhealthy relationships, right? And the self-centeredness um, and indulgence in my appetite. So some might argue some of the things that we see labeled as a sexual addiction is really somebody who is indulging their own appetite at the expense of others. And there may in fact be some who have a sexual addiction, but sometimes you have to tease out a compulsive behaviors from something that fits the full definition of the dependence. But we're not just restricted to chemical dependencies anymore. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And I will take your cards, but I am catching a plane and I have to change my clothes. So give me your cards quickly. <laughs>